Yeah. So hello everyone. I hope everyone is doing well. Um today what we're going to be going through is going to be um BBC and um uh, ML flow um and model tracking using um ML flow. So what is data version control? Um, so from the previous sessions that we've had, we've seen that tracking data using Git is um, really difficult and Git is used to store our code. And so when we're working with um, large amount of data, even in megabytes, um, sometimes going to gigabytes and terabytes, um, we can't store, it. We, we would have to separate the logic of our code and our data, um, right? So some part of our code that we're about to modify might uh, need um, a huge chunks of data while the others might not. And so this separation between data and code um, is really necessary. And so that's what we're going to be seeing and also um, seeing the different challenges that come when we're experimenting and building machine learning models and how, um, why, and um, the different ways we use to track our models are some of the things that we're going to be seeing today. Uh, so we start off with data version control or DBC. Um, so DBC, it's a system for data version control. It is similar to Git, and most of the syntax that we're going to see um, are going to show that, but it is used for data um, and not code. Uh, so DBC allows us to keep the information about different versions of your data uh, Why in Git. So it is built on top of Git, uh, but it does not store your original data um, inside of Git itself. So Git will not store that original data. The original data will be elsewhere um, in your remote storage, um, but Git will also have all of the information or for all of the versions of the data that you actually specify. Um, yeah, so commands are very similar with Git. Uh, yeah, and why DBC, right? Um, so there are um, lots of reasons we use DBC these days. Um, so the first major reason is data versioning. Um, so data versioning, it is enabled by replacing um, large files, uh, data six directories, maybe even machine learning models um, with small meta files, uh, with very small files that Git can actually handle. And this actually acts as pointers to the original data. So this is what creates this um, separation and decoupling from uh, the source code in our data. Uh, yeah, and the other reason is for data storage. Um, On-premises or cloud storage can be used to store um, the project's data. So um, it would be pretty cumbersome process to store large amounts of data on the compute that we're working on, uh, right? We might need to clean some of the data. And so there are definitely cheaper alternatives these days. Um, we have um, Google Drive to start off with, we have um, Amazon S3. Um, and so it, it allows this um, ease of separation of storage. Um, and it also allows, um, yeah, and it is also very easy to use, right? Um, DVC is very quick to install um, and it does not require any special infrastructure, um, nor does it depend on APIs or external services. Um, yeah, it is a standard on CLI too. Um, so we can go on to the technical demo. Uh, everyone, yeah, everyone has joined in. Uh, so I believe everyone can see my screen. Um, so what we have here for anyone that is that wants to follow along um, is we simply have. Uh, created a Python virtual environment that we have here, and we have a data which is um, a CSV file. Uh, this CSV file is just a Bitcoin USD uh, data set. Um, so I'm pretty sure most of you uh, 
yeah so i'm pretty sure most of you know bitcoin um there are some who are going to uh, we're going to join the web3 track so yeah um let's zoom out of this week's challenge and um just focus on the general concepts so this is going to be the data we're going to be using so this is bitcoin's data uh so what you see here are the opening price on so this is a weekly data as you can see so it starts off um it starts off at the eight months um on the first day um uh, and then it goes on um, so 0808 um 0815 so this we have a weekly data with the opening price for that week um the highs of that week so the peak price that it had reached the low price the lowest um it had been within that week uh so the actual closing data so uh the crypto market is actually open throughout the entire week but um yeah we can we can use aggregated daily values uh, to specify this and the volume is um just the amount of trading that has occurred within that time so we're going to be using this data to see some of the some of the things that pvc actually helps uh solve so let's create an analysis notebook so is that a question i can't see your screen so i will I think if anyone has a question, you can go in between and ask. Um, so, uh, yeah, Margaret, uh, am I not going to? No, okay. Um, yeah, yeah, so what I, yeah, the adjusted clues, is that, uh, is that your question? Yes, that's my question. Yeah. So what ADJ close is is just um, an adjusted close price. So um, it, it will definitely depend on um, where exchange, um, where we're buying or selling this um, value. So um, usually the normal there, there some sometimes you you can sort of think of the closing price and the adjusted close price as the same data points, um, but some exchanges use different type of data. Um, there might be some intervals where the market actually ended and where there were actually open positions. So there were other buyers or sellers um, at that moment. And so there, there, there might be some difference, but you can think of the closing and the, just the close price as this as very similar. Um, okay, so uh, let's, read in the data uh read csv um so data usd dot csv um and as you can see the date column is can be our index column because it's the unique column uh, and we can parse dates uh we can set the parts dates to true to parse our data to parse the type of the date. Uh, yeah, so we have our data frame, right? Um, and so we now have a data, which is a weekly data, right? So uh, by the end of this, when we go on to ML flow, we're going to be uh, building a prediction model, uh, which actually predicts the price of, uh, which actually predicts the price of Bitcoin. Um, but let's say now you have weekly data, right? So you can go on and use this data to say, okay, maybe next week the price is going to go up. Um, maybe after a couple of weeks, it's going to go up, right? Um, but let's say that's not really what we want, right? Okay, um, we want to see if the price of Bitcoin is going to maybe increase over a period of a month. We don't want to go on every week and check, but we want to be sure, okay, over the next period of, a month that we've specified the price is going to either increase or decrease um, and so uh, and so for that type of analysis we would um, need to resample this data right so a weekly data would not be necessary and uh, um, we a monthly data would be sufficient um, so we could have uh, we have a new data frame uh, with the resample method i believe um, and uh, the months 
could do. Uh, and let's say we decide to take the need and fit this in beta three. Uh, yeah. And so for this for this analysis, we would have a monthly data, right? So for the eight months of the year, for the nine months of the year, uh, for the 10 months, for the 11 months, for the month of December, uh, we would have uh, we'd have a median data. Uh, so we've resampled uh, the weekly data into a monthly data. And we we will then go on to build our model or do our analysis uh, based on this monthly data, right? Um, and so we now have this data, but we, what we, we now want to store it, right? So what would we normally do? We'd go and save this back into the data folder. We don't want to override this uh, this file that we have here in data. So we'd then go on to maybe give it a new a new uh, a new name, right? So monthly resampled dot csv, uh, and so we'd have this csv file. And so you can think of we now have just two csvs, and so this might not seem like a big problem. But let's, what if we had started off with a minute data, right? Um, and we wanted to do analysis on a minute basis. We then went on to do analysis on an hourly basis, um, on a daily basis, yearly basis, maybe. Um, and so we'd have this um, tons of CSV files um, with a bunch of random names. So this is, um, so from Git's perspective, this would simply be as if like copy pasting codes and um, Naming naming the directories that our code um, resides on, like so, code version one, and then having another folder with code version two, right? Uh, and so this cumbersome process is not something we'd have to deal with uh, thanks to DBC. So this is now unnecessary. Uh, we can delete this, and so our BTC .usd, uh, our BTC .usd weekly data is what we're going to be uh, building upon. So we've stated before that DVC is built using Git, uh, on top of Git. So um, we would need to initialize um, our Git repository. So we're in this proper directory, and we initialize an empty repository. Uh, we initialize this empty repository, and let's untrack some of the Price. We don't want Git to actually track like the virtual environment and this data right here. Yeah. So inside of our Git ignore, let's untrack all files um, inside of our virtual environment, um, and also um, let us untrack the BTC USD data because that is not what we want to be tracked by Git, right? We want we want to track it using using PPC. Um, this okay, it's coming up. Status. Yeah. So the only untracked files we have are the the Git ignore file and the analysis notebook. So anything um, in the data is not there. So we've initialized our Git repository. And the next thing that we do is, um, if you have not done so, um, install DVC. Uh, we simply do that by doing pip install DVC. I already have DVC installed. Um, and so after having DVC installed, we do this. We do very similar processes as um, we be doing it. Uh, so we we initialize our DVC product by using DVC init, um, and so what this has done is it has initialized uh, a new DVC repository. So just like when we initialize a new Git, Git repository, we get a dot Git um, a dot Git directory. We get a dot DVC directory. Um, so the interesting part about the DVC init is um, it actually already um, Staged the. Uh, it's, it's actually staged uh, some of the DVC files um, when we uh, initialize the DVC repository. Uh, and so the next thing to do, um, let's make sure that we've started uh, with 
uh, we've already initialized the DVC project, so we can do that by uh, it's a feature uh, initializes um, DVC repo, and we can commit that. Uh, so we can so what you're going to see here is that DVC and Git um, work side by side, um, and yeah, and that it's that the commands that we use um, the Git to track the files. Um, actually also rely on Git, um, not only DVC. Um, yeah, so the thing that we've said about DVC is that it, uh, it allows us to decouple our code and our data, right? So our data source would then have to be a remote. Um, so right now, the data is just in this data directly, but by setting a specific remote, our data can rely elsewhere. Um, somewhere else um, that somewhere else might be like i said before uh, amazon s3 google drive or um, even some other directly um, within our local or uh, within our local system like we're going to see you now so the way we do that is by using uh, dvc remote add um, and we can set this new remote this you can set it Uh, so you can think of this as simply setting a Git remote as well. Um, so we would set a default remote, um, and we would specify the path of our uh, remote repository. So uh, let's set let's to easily to easily visualize. We can set it inside of our temp folder, uh, and we can see uh, DVC and academy. And so this would be our, okay, so I think the following arguments are required. Um, DVC remote add. So this is the URL we're specifying maybe. Um, I'd have to specify that it's local. Uh, yeah, the name of the remote and the actual remote location. So this is the remote location. Um, the following arguments are required. So DVC remote add minus D. Or as well. Um, okay, so I think we can go to the documentation to see uh, how the DVC remote is added. Uh, So depending on your storage type, you may also need DVC remote add. Uh, DVC will determine the type of remote. Uh, so we don't have any remote set. Uh, DVC remote ls. DVC remote. One moment. Okay, so sorry about that. I think, yeah, definitely. Uh, so what was wrong was, um, so DVC remote, what we're trying to do is add the specific remote, right? So default, and then we'd have to give our remote some name. Um, like we give git uh, the name of remote origin, um, we'd need to specify some name for um, the DVC remote as well. 
and we can set specify the path. So this my remote is the name of the remote we're specifying it as, um, and where we want it would be the URL of that is continuing. So inside of our temp folder, um, DC storage uh, 10 Academy, right? So it now saves the remote as uh, as a default remote. So if we do DVC remote list, um, we can see that our uh, remote is set to this directory. So if we so right now we're using the local file system to interact with everything. And so if we go to this directory, uh, we go to slash temp uh, and DVC storage and academy. And academy. Oops. We have DVC storage here. But our remote is set to here. Um, no such file. Okay. So, yeah. Uh, Sorry about that. Uh, yeah. Okay. So let's remove that. Uh, let's remove this DVC storage that we have. Uh, DVC storage. Um, and let's also remove the remote that we have set here. Right. So DVC remove. Um, we named it my remote. And the ML folder to YAML doesn't exist. Um, DVC remote. What is happening? DVC remote list. I have my remote. Uh, so DVC remote, let's add a new default um, remote to and specify the path to be. DVC storage. Setting my remote remote to as default. Uh, so DVC remote list. We now have set two remotes with remote to as the default. Um, and so if we go here and see, we should have a DVC. We should have a we should have a DVC storage file. If we don't. What is happening? Um, um, so we do a DVC init, DVC log, initializes a DVC repo. Um, we add the remote and Ah, okay, so is it because Git is not tracking? Uh, uh, okay, so we've added the remote. Uh, let's commit the repo. Let's DVC remote. Uh, so we've modified the DVC config. Let's add that. And we, we now have the DVC remote set. Um, and we have Git tracking it. Uh, and so if we don't have the storage, OK, so let's, let's make the DVC storage file automatically. Uh, and that should, it should serve as the as um our dvc repository um i do hope we're not gonna get any errors this was not supposed to happen um but that should that should work as well uh so we have this version of our data right and we want to track that this is the first version of our data because we're going to go on um and into resampling it into a monthly data 
Um, and so uh, how we do that is um, we first add uh, this data um, using uh, with using DVC add um, and specifying the path of our data. So it's inside data and inside of btcusd.csv file. Um, and so what it does is it generates this um, csv.dvc file. Um, so this this csv.dvc file is track is having an information. So this MD5 is just the hash, um, which is holding the information um, for the data that is going to be stored in our remote, right? Um, and so it's BTC usd.csv, the name of the file, and it would have its own size. And so the remote that we set, uh, it can be, uh, can be anywhere. Uh, so like the directory we specified was inside of DVC storage within our temp file. So if we go into DVC storage, we have nothing. I am in the correct directory, right? We have this DVC file. Okay, so yeah, okay. So let's, we, we now have this remote set when we actually added it. Um, but we also need to commit and to specify that we are now tracking our data, right? So data attracts, what this does is attracts initial data. Um, on yeah so untracked files status uh, what we want to do is to actually add the right yeah so we want to add a DVC file to git so we want to add this DVC file and we can commit that this tracks our initial data. So Git is also tracking our data. Mm. So within the temp folder, uh, side of DVC storage, uh, so this was this is actually just the gen the general flow, and this we were supposed to actually access. We were supposed to get the hash of it. Um, on the remote that we specified. Uh, so we see the config. The remote is, remote two is this. There is nothing there though. Wait, okay, so I'm sorry about that, but I guess we're going to have just to go over the theoretical aspects of it. Um, but this, so what you're supposed to do is this remote is supposed to be either a URL to Google Drive or some somewhere that you actually specify here. And um, so when you go in there, you're actually going to have um, you're you're actually going to have this actually raw data stored there. Um, and when you, and that file is then supposed to be. Uh, I can get it more as well. Uh, yeah, and so what DVC would uh, would actually allow you to do is it would get those um, it would get those files from it would get those files from that specific remote. And so when you do the when you do DVC pull command, uh, when you do DVC pull, it is actually supposed to pull in the data. Uh, I'm not sure if it has actually. 
twerk another directory, maybe a specific user configuration. So we can delete this BTC USD uh, data uh, minus RF. Um, and so if when you do a DDC pull, it is supposed to get it from the remote. Okay, so it got our our file. And so I'm not completely sure if the temp storage is is causing a problem. Um, okay, yeah, so I think you can see my screen now. I'm not sure what what's happening to this terminal. Maybe it's uh or is it it's not it's not here as well. Okay, so maybe it's the way I've set the remote. Um, but as you can see, this we went on to we went on to delete the data. Um, and when we do a DVC pull, it fetches that data from the remote, right? And so what this what this specific hash is doing is it is um, so inside of that remote directory, you're going to have um, this hash where DVC is going to pull and push it from, uh, right? So we can go on to so, yeah, and the next one. Uh, my question is, when we uh, set the remote repository, like we can make it in our local storage, but if we're co collaborating over a same project, how one, how can one get the same file when we do DVC pull? Um, okay, so that's a great question. Um, so if you go into DVC uh, um, Google Drive, I think, uh, the easiest way to get definitely get started with using this is to set the remote uh, to Google Drive. So you can do that um, just by using uh, by adding a specific folder. And so um, if everyone has has access to if the project really doesn't matter, you can make it a, pro a public folder for now. Um, but if yeah, but if people are already given shared access and when you do a dvc pool if you have access to that folder so to that specific folder in google drive you will have access to it so i think then yeah so, uh, Jose. So, for, for, uh, so in our case uh, i guess it's better to use uh, google drive as a remote uh, uh, I yeah. think, uh, storage, yeah. right yes yes, yes, yes. Okay, okay thank you um, yeah, uh, I have a problem with that. I started it and uh, first I was able to make a, a remote in my local machine and it was working. But after creating the different version, I would like to access to the different version in my, my ML codes and it's like I don't have access anymore to the remote, local remote. So I don't know what happens and how to fix that. Um, okay, so um, like, so you have access, you already have the data inside of your local remote, right? Yes, before, but now it's like I don't have access to the remote anymore, and is 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 the problem is similar to. It's similar to the one you are having just a moment ago. Uh, it's like I can't have access to the remote anymore. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. So I'm not. Yeah. I'm also not really sure if what the why the remote is not um, tracking it at the moment. But I think okay. So that might that might also be to have something to do with the folder. So I think that's create another folder inside documents final track and this was working pretty well. So uh VC storage, right? And we want to set this as uh as the file that's uh, that is going to store um, our remote uh, our our actual data. Okay, so we can 
do uh, get remote add and change uh, again to a new remote, uh, find a remote, uh, and specify the path of the DVC storage. Uh, Is that Git or uh, DVC? Uh, yeah, yeah, DVC. Um, DVC remote add set it as a final remote. So we have this final remote. And so that final remote should be this DVC storage folder that we just created in our uh, in our storage, right? Uh, so we have that remote and I think we can do a DVC push. We have that one file pushed. And so, yeah, okay, so we have a seven. Yeah, I did not do a DVC push. I'm really sorry. Um, yeah, so I think that might be the case. Um, so what DVC is doing is it, it is creating this hash, right? So this A7, um, this start file that you're seeing is now this A7 um, over the new directory that we've created. Um, and so over that collaboration, um, yeah, just changing that URL should actually work. And so when you go to A7, um, we should see the remaining hash, this remaining hash as a folder. Uh, and yeah, so we have that. Uh, one. Yeah, okay, yeah, so this is actually a file. So this is the raw dump that we actually have. Um, yeah, so the raw data that we actually wanted to track using DVC. So the initial version, um, the weekly version that we have. Um, yeah, so that pushes it to the remote. Um, so the DVC push command is the final command which pushes uh, the changes that are tracked by DVC into our uh, remote repository. Uh, and so the, the remote that, you, that you set, uh, if the data is pushed, it, sh it should be there. Uh, yeah, sorry about that. Uh, the... Yeah, but, but my problem is that uh, I think that I, I did push and the data was there, but from one moment to the next, I can have access to the remote anymore. Like you don't have, you don't have access to the remote as in like, um, so when you're trying to access it from ML flow, um, it, it's it's saying you don't have access. Yes, um, exactly. exactly. Um, okay, so that that might be a permission issue. So um, just maybe use. No, but so if I, have, if uh, I try to list the remote and the remote is there, but it's like yeah. I can access it. Yeah. So the remote might have. Um, specific permissions. So there, there are directories which you may or may not access. So I think maybe try and uh, set uh, permissions for the actual directory. Uh, so I think it would go as 777 um, for the specific remote that you specify. And so if the user that you're currently using has um, specific permission to view that, um, you should have access to it. Um, if, yes, but I'm surprised because it was working before now. It was working before, and I don't know how it's asking for. Um, okay, I think I think we can we can go. Let's go over this tutorial, and I think we can jump on a call um, and see it together. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah. So what we see here is yeah. So we have um, in our directory uh, we have this file, which is our data file, right? And so what was the initial beginning that we had? Um, so the initial thought that we had is if we actually wanted to resample it into monthly data, we don't want another data here, right? Um, and so this is what DVC allows us to do. So we didn't need to create a new data. We could simply just, um, we could simply just update the this existing data. We can override it. Um, and so we now have this overwritten monthly data inside of the BTC um, USD 
.csv file and DVC should automatically be able to actually, uh, yeah, uh, so DVC would, would then go on to track this new version using um, DVC. So there are processes that you go on to repeat. And so we would then go on to again, um, do a DVC add sort of like um, adding to the Git staging we would go on to add the DVC uh, to, add, uh, to add our data so that it is tracked because this is now a new version. And so that new version change results in this .dvc file then changing to a new version, changing to a new hash, right? Um, and so we, and so after this, um, after this we'd go on to get add uh, this specific DVC file. Um, so the way we do that is, uh, so we'd go on to add this DVC file um, and track that DVC file using Git. Um, and so you can store the hash information uh, by using, okay, so this is uh, weekly uh, monthly data actually. Uh, so monthly sample the data, um, and so we'd then go on to uh, to track the DVC file, right? And then you would go on to DVC push, uh, which would push on our data. And so if we go back now and see, we should we have two versions of the, of the data, the initial version that we had. Um, which was the one that started with A7, which was the weekly data. And we would then have this 2B, um, which is the second version of our data, uh, which is the, is the monthly sample data. So if you see here, yeah. So we then have this monthly uh, sample data available here. So, so there are processes that go on and repeat each other. These are the DVC add, the git commit, um, the git add to actually add um, the dot, that specific dot DVC file, which has that essential, um, that essential hash information for the data that is stored over on our remote. Uh, the git commit, which, um, which holds the commit information for uh, the new DVC hash that was created, um, and then the DVC push, which is um, pushing our data to our remote. So that those processes repeat over and over again um, whenever we have this, uh, whenever we have, uh, whenever we have new uh, new variants of our data, um, and so that is the process we go we go and iterate over and over. Um, yeah, uh, so if we go and get log, we can see we have the specific, uh, we have specific data samples um, that we're using. Um, but when we go on to MLflow, um, if you go over um, to get tagging, um, so on top of our commit messages, um, we, we need to, we can use the commit message, but definitely tagging, um, tagging those specific commit versions um, in order not to use the commit hash, but um, the specific versions. When, when, when we go into a it will be a lot clearer, but we're actually going to, uh, we're actually going to tag our um, releases. So, this monthly sample data, uh, we can go on to tag it as uh, minus a, if I'm not mistaken, yeah. So we're going to annotate it, uh, give it a version one. Okay, so we didn't we didn't tag the previous version. Uh, so let's just go on and tag this as the version one. Uh, and uh, we can give it a, message as uh, version one weekly data. Um, yeah, so we can do that. So if we do a git log, we can see that our 
our version is tagged. So we would have an easy time actually accessing the data. We would uh, either way, we would, um, the other way to do it would be to use the commit hash. But if our data is tagged, um, it would be easier to actually do that. Um, and so I think we can also go on and create a newer version, I think, because seeing that um, would make things easier. Um, so we have this weekly data. Um, how can we resample this? Okay, so we can go on and to end also resample this maybe using uh, two week periods, right? Um, so we want to do an analysis over a period of two weeks. Uh, so yeah, so this resamples our data into periods of two weeks. Um, and so that could be our newer version um, of the data. Uh, so we have this two week version that is inside of a new data frame. Uh, and we can save that to the CSV file, uh, BTC USD.csv. So we save that. And you, what are the processes that we save, repeat again and again? Um, so there uh, we. So the first thing we do is we add it to our DVC, uh, right? So we add the data so that DVC knows that our data has actually changed. Right now we see that Git neither Git nor GPC are doing anything about the data, right? The data is just there. It has been changed. We know it has been changed because we're the ones that changed it, but neither of them know uh, what is happening. So we add the data um, and then we get add to, to track the changes that has that have happened over DVC. Uh, we add it, we, so we get add, um, uh, dot dvc file um, yeah so we get add the dot dvc file uh, we get commit uh, data um, adds uh, by weekly by weekly data um, and then we if we see a git log um, we see that this is our tagged version um, but this is not a tagged version right so we go on to tag it. We give it a let's say a version two, uh, a version two. Uh, give it a message. Uh, version two uh, with by weekly data. Right. So if we do a git log now, uh, we see that this has been tagged with version two, and we have we now have um, a tagged version one. Right. And so. What this has allowed us is to have only one single CSV file, but if we go over the remote, uh, the remote storage that we have set, yeah, again, I forgot to do a DVC push. Um, yeah, so one file pushed, so it is then pushed to our remote. Um, and so we can see the last remote is the 64. Uh, so we now have, again, a new version of the data. Right, a bi-weekly resampled version of our data. Um, and so these are just the processes that you iterate to. Whatever your remote is, it does not matter. Um, but this DVC add, um, then the Git adding and committing, um, and the Git tagging, because DVC and Git actually are working side by side um, to iterate over the process um, are the things that you do with, with DVC to actually um, just have a single file tracked, right? Um, and so if you wanted to go back to this specific version of the prod of your data, uh, what you could do is, um, let's say uh, you can, uh, you wanted it, you can delete the data itself. And what did I delete? Yeah, okay. I can delete the DVC file. Um, so what you can do is, um, let's say we now want the version one of our data, right? So we've git log here. You can check out the, this specific branch, and then you can do a DVC pull. Um, this specific uh, this specific commit has access to the 
to the specific version that DVC was pre previously tracking. And so a DVC pool, um, after checking out into this commit, would get you the previous version, um, to, would get you the previous version of that data, uh, right? Or you can also can also check out um, this, this specific file itself, going back to this commit, right? So without touching any other code that may have changed um, over the coming time. So if we do a git checkout uh, to this specific commit, and let's say we just want to check out this file, we want to we want this specific btcusd.csp.dvc file to go back in time. Uh, what we can do is we can do this. I believe this checks out. Yeah. So this checks it out into the the version to, into the hash containing the first version. Right, and so this DVC pool now that we do, where it gets the data from the remote, this data is now the initial version that we had. So the version one that we tagged, which is uh, the monthly data and not the biweekly data of uh, of DVC. Uh, yeah, and so this interaction, yeah, just don't forget the iterative flows that go on and repeat again and again. Um, yeah, but this this is pretty much it from DBC. Uh, so does anyone have any questions around that? Um, okay, yeah. So if, I hope that's clear. Um, so the first uh, initial thing that I forgot was to do a DVC push. Um, of course, the remote wouldn't get it um, if you actually haven't pushed from your local repository. Uh, so the, the remote is empty. There, there is this separation, um, just like where you have two Git repositories. Um, when you store it on GitHub, you, um, you, you have this decoupling over on DVC as well. Um, Okay, so I think the next thing that we're going to look at um, is going to be MLflow. Um, okay, I hope things are clear. Uh, yeah, so what are some of the challenges in machine learning, right? Um, so it is very difficult to keep track of experiments. Um, for example, um, let's say you're trying to build a model, right? Um, and uh, your model had um, had a really good accuracy, but uh, you changed a couple of parameters um, and then it started getting worse and worse. And if you wanted to actually revert back and go back to where it was, you wouldn't be able to, you'd either need to have a very specific Excel sheet um, or have a really good memory. Uh, but other than that, you'd really have a hard time tracking those experiments, right? And it's really difficult to also reproduce code. Um, yeah, and there's also um, no standard way to package and deploy models. Um, every library has its um, has its own ways. Um, every data science team has um, their own ways where they make models and actually deploy it. Um, and also there is no central story. Um, to manage models, right? Um, there, are version, there are specific versions you might have, um, a version one of your model, a version two of your model, and um, some transitions where you go through various cycles of your model. Um, and so the, the model goes through um, various life cycles. Um, yeah, so what is MLflow? And this is where MLflow comes in. Um, MLflow is an MLOps tool that can be used to increase the efficiency of machine learning experimentation and productionalization. Um, so MLflow has, uh, is organized into a couple of components like tracking um, projects, models, and registry. And what we're going to look at um, is tracking and also the overview of some of the things. Um, yeah, and MLflow helps track hundreds of models, container environments, data sets, model parameters, and hyperparameters. Um, and it also allows you to reproduce them whenever it's needed. Um, so this was taken from the, homepage of MLflow. Um, so if you go to mlflow.org, you'd, you'd be able to see this um, explanation of 
um, or projects and whatnot. So I think let's, since time is running out, we can go on to the MFLU demo. Um, I think let me copy, uh, yeah, so let me copy the model training notebook into this. Uh, so, yeah. so we have this model training notebook uh, where we actually use the specified data. Uh, so what we're doing here is we're just importing a couple of libraries. Um, and we, we load in the BTC USD data that we have here, um, where we get all of the columns that we had. Um, and yeah, so this is the Bitcoin's, Bitcoin's price um, over the months of October, January, April, and July. Um, yeah, I think you can see my screen. Properly, yeah, so this has, so it's been a downward spiral for Bitcoin. Um, and so what we want to do is we want to forecast. Um, okay, so this, this is actually um, quite resampled, I guess. Uh, so this is months, this is the monthly data. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it might work, it might, but I think we might have to switch off to the bi-weekly data to actually get enough data to train our model. Yeah, but what we want to do is to actually predict the next period um, of, our, of the Bitcoin data, right? So we have this closing price and we create this new close forecast, uh, close forecast uh, column, which would have the next period, right? So for the initial period, um, we had a closing value of 46,365. And so um, it would then go on to actually predict the, the next month's data. Uh, so let's drop the any values. Um, and so this is supposed to create our split. Um, yeah, so we have a training set length of um, 11 periods. Uh, we have a training set length of 11 periods and a, va a validation set length of one. And so what we're trying to do is just fit a linear regression model. Yeah, so we've set a, we've just trained a linear regression model, which is supposed to predict what the, what the next period's um, price is going to be, right? Um, and so what this gives us is, um, what this is giving us is the performance or the R2 coefficient, um, the R2 coefficient, which just is the variation of, um, the variation of what our, what our model actually predicted um, and the actual value within that period. And so it is just a way to square our linear regression model. Um, and so we have a 0.82 score. The nearer it is to one, um, the better. Uh, so we have a good, we have a pretty good score at the moment, but we actually want to maybe then go on and modify our, our data to see if um, another version of the data is actually um, going, to, going to give us a better R2 score, right? Yeah. Uh, so what we can do is uh, we have this, we're, we're using DBC, so we know we have uh, we know we have a better we know we have a better version of tracking the data. So let's go on into DBC ML flow tutorial. Uh, so if we see to if we go to Git log right now, we've went back to the initial version of the data, right? So we've checked this specific file out. Um, into this commit, right? And so I think let's check it back in into this one. Uh, so git checkout. Um, 
that specific hash um, for that specific data. Uh, so the checkout, uh, I think, dot BBC, yeah, updated fast. So we now get the updated data over on DBC. Right, so if we do a DBC pull, it should get us it should get us the data from the DBC remote, which is uh, specified here. So the data with the specific MD5 hash. So I do over on our remote, right? And so we go on over again, and uh, we don't need this. We now have new data. Uh, so we have this biweekly data now. Uh, we shift. We do the same processes. And then we train our model, and so we see we get a new R score. I think I believe they were very they're very similar at the moment, but you can see the process when we go over and over again and actually experiment um again and again. We're you're going we're really going to lose um what you've done. You wouldn't know if it wasn't for DVC, we wouldn't be able to track our different versions of our data. But even with GVC, we now don't know which version of the data we've used, right? We don't know if it's the weekly version. We don't know if it's the monthly version. Uh, we don't know if it's a daily version of the data. We, 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 have, we haven't properly tracked it. We either need to write everything down as we go on, or we need a better way of tracking things. Uh, and so that's where MLflow comes in. Um, Again, let me copy another notebook from here. Uh, copy model training with mlflow.iqimb into the mlflow tutorial folder. Um, yeah, and so the only thing different that has been done here um, is let's, okay, so let's run that. So what you do is you can, there is this tip with pip install um, DVC and pip install MLflow, we now have access to the MLflow client and the DVC client as well. Um, and so what you can do is this DVC API dot get URL um, gets us, um, allows us to get specific versions of our data for specific experiments. Um, OK, so let me go back into the DVC MLflow tutorial. Um, if you haven't done so, you'd have to go on and install MLflow as well to get access to MLflow. Um, I've already installed it. Um, and so you start MLflow by specifying the MLflow UI. Um, trying in one second, uh, I think. OK, so there might be another server running over on port 5000. So that. Um, and let's start off MLflow UI. So MLflow UI is now start is now running at port 5000. Uh, so if you go over and see, uh, this is what you get, right? So we haven't run any experiment using MLflow, but we now have MLflow up and running. Uh, and so what this does is it is just specifying the paths, and that So this is where the tag comes in. Um, you could we could use we could have used the commit for this, but using the tag definitely makes a lot of things easier. Um, okay, uh, so using the tag definitely makes a lot of things easier. And so what? How you start off? We're experimenting, right? We're experimenting with our machine learning, and so uh, we start off by setting the specific experiment and setting the specific things we want to track. Like right now, even using DVC, we've been able to see that we can, uh, we don't really know which version that we've used, right? Um, and so for this specific experiment, we're going to be using version one and we're going to be specifying that. We have this data version, we have this data URL, we know which variables um, we're going to be using. Um, okay. So we have ML runs here. Uh, we did not have that before, right? Experiment does not exist. It's created a new experiment. Run. Okay, so we have 
and it is trying to log it. We have a version one of our data. We have the bdcusd.csv file. Um, maybe if we run another experiment and the run not found. Uh, is it trying to or Okay. Let's go dollar param. Okay, I'm going to client. Um, yeah, sorry about that. Um, my connection interrupted. Um, so where was I? Um, anyone? So, and MFO well is also having issues. Um, yeah, so we have this file um right yeah uh yeah so we have our specific model this dbc api is supposed to oh, okay so my screen is not being shared I think you can see my screen now. Uh, let's start off ML flow UI. Uh, connection in use. Yeah, so you'd set the specific experiment. Uh, I'm not completely sure why it's not getting. So we have the the tag two, which is the biweekly data, um, which is this one, uh, and so this DVC API dot get URL. Um, you are inside of that directory as well. So okay, so this let's get the version two of the data, and if we run it. Uh, it's not getting it. Uh, no such file or directory slash temp slash DVC storage. 
Um, of course, we actually then changed our we changed our remote to actually point to to this to this directory, right? Um, it's no longer DVC storage. Um, But I believe it is just it is going on and looking inside of DVC storage. So if we, I think we can go over onto config, uh, and okay. So let's remove these two remotes. We're not using them. Uh, so we have that. I do not found it is still looking into that directory. Uh, okay, so delete the trash. Let's also delete this, move the trash. Um, okay, so if we run this, and then once does not exist, um, dot ml bank folder since we're using a local storage um, it should be it should be what it's actually using so if we go over up that might not work so I think if we go over to ml flows uh, site and look at ml flow tracking um, we can see the flow that it actually that it actually utilizes, right? So we we are running it locally, um, where we have our machine learning code, and the MLflow client is actually interacting with that ML runs directory, which is um, supposed to store each run. Um, so an advanced, a, a bit more advanced scenario would be um, using an SQL like database, which would still be there. Um, but the I think when we we're working on an actual production and um, where you would use another remote database, which um, would be maybe a managed uh, AWS database um, in Amazon RDS or something like that. Uh, so yeah, this is not working. Uh, invalid parent directory. Yeah, but this this is the this is the similar process that you follow. I think time has really gone by um, and it might take some time to debug this that's what that's I think the big problem uh, with this live sessions uh, I think we can try and debug them while people who actually have questions ask for the next 10 minutes or so and if they can't be fixed um, we'll go we'll end the session here uh, and you'll definitely reach out to me on Slack with the questions that you have. Um, so if anyone has any questions, uh, feel free to unmute and ask me. Uh, so if anyone has questions, uh, let's, let's maybe delete the file if it's that from the so so and I show why okay so we have the worker boot up let's delete the data that we have here let uh let's Let's get uh, MLflow to get that itself. Uh, BTCUSD.csv. Um, yeah, so we have the tracking version. Um, the repository is located there. Um, let's maybe give it an absolute pass if that's becoming a problem. Uh, and yeah, so let us. See how this goes. Name PD is not defined. Okay, so I think that's better. I think it's because we haven't imported it in that one. Okay, so 
file not found, that's still looking into, uh, yeah. So it is still this DVC API. Uh, DVC is looking into this remote DVC storage, uh, which, which is not the case. Um, yeah, and that's the problem here. I haven't specified any DVC storage here, right? The storage is not there. The config, everything has been removed. Ah, uh, okay. So I think let's also delete everything that we have in, uh, we have inside of the template, um, inside of our cache. Uh, my RF, uh, DVC slash cache. Uh, and let's, Try this again. Okay. And I left the consists of that specific information. Um, let's restart MFOUI. Let's restart our kernel. The API see set there. We have that config. Um, okay, so probably something very simple that I experiment with me. Yeah, it, it is creating those experiments so. Let's just look over at the MFO UI. So this is what you would have. So each experiment would be tracked by a mesh load. And this um, log params allows you to track the parameter file. Um, and this maybe log metric would allow you to log that specific metric. Um, and so if we wanted to track this, if you also wanted to track this image using MFO, there is the log artifact method, which can take any file. Um, it can save your model. It can take. It can save your pictures. Um, but for saving models, there is also the log model, uh, which is specific to some of the libraries that exist, like sklearn um, and TensorFlow. Uh, and so that is that is normally the process of MLflow. Uh, and you would get all of those runs here. Um, yeah, and using log model, you would be able to actually use the model registry um, using the log, using the log, if you use the log model, I believe this one requires the use of um, a Postgres database, um, to, I mean, not uh, a remote database. Um, and so using uh, your local um, MLflow server would not be, um, sufficient, um, yeah, but that's about it. And so that's the flow of DVC and ML flow. Um, yeah, I, I, would have, I definitely would have loved it if everyone got to see um, the use of ML flow and we actually saw the data being stored and so the scores. Um, I'm not sure if I have the previous ML flow yeah, I think I closed it. Um, yeah, so I don't have it now. I do not want to take any more of your time. Um, if you have any questions, you can ask me now or um, on Slack. Yes. Yeah. That, that's it for the tutorial today, um, if anyone doesn't have any questions. So I'll stop the recording here and thank you everyone for attending.